Today is January 10th, 2023, and my guest is oncologist and professor of epidemiology, Vinay Prasad. This is Vinay's third appearance on Econ Talk. He was last here in July of 2022, talking about the p- pandemic. Vinay, welcome back to Econ Talk. Russ, such a pleasure to be back. I want to remind listeners to go to econtalk.org, where you'll find a link devoted to our annual survey of your favorite episodes of last year. Our topic for today is the state of cancer research and pharmaceuticals based on an article from Vinay's Vinay's Substack page that we will link to, but I suspect we'll get into other topics as well. I'm going to start with a quote. You write, quote, I'm a capitalist. I believe that profit is a powerful and fruitful incentive. Without it, often people become lazy and complacent. As such, I believe it should exist in cancer medicine, but it must be used wisely. Money should be given for real advancements and breakthroughs, hard work and going the extra mile, but be kept away from products that don't benefit people. This is essentially the theme of my book, Malignant, which has specific recommendations for how to incentivize what works. The tragedy is in oncology is that we have dismantled the system that is meant to tell these two apart, real innovation from pseudo innovation, end quote. Explain. Yeah, I think many of your listeners may feel similarly, but I am a capitalist. You know, I do believe that one of the greatest engines for human prosperity and development is that we incentivize people to the fruits of their labor so that a person who's working in the hospital might get paid a little bit extra if they stay late and do the extra procedure. And I think you want to find the right balance. You don't want to pay them so much extra that they're looking for business that doesn't exist, but you certainly don't, you know, you certainly want to use incentives to get the behavior you so desire. And the same is true in drug development. I think we have a system where we incentivize heavily pharmaceutical products to be developed. And I like that too. And I'm happy to incentivize drugs that are really transformational, drugs that turn one's fatal diseases to diseases with near normal life expectancy should have a large return on investment. But what I worry about is the system has been so manipulated and so hijacked and is very technical so that the average person watching may not be able to grasp all the all the evidence that you cannot tell apart a drug that's a blockbuster because it has really strong marketing and a drug that's a blockbuster because it's really changing lives. And to me, the fact we're reimbursing both of those drugs, similarly, that's a problem. Uh, I know it's kind of an unanswerable question, but of the number of drugs that are subsidized through Medicare, Medicaid, and most private insurance companies, how many, what proportion of those do you think are actually blockbusters? Or what proportion of money that's spent actually is transformational rather than extends possibly life a few months as opposed to something close to normal life expectancy? So uh, I would say it's the minority that are really transformational uh, in terms of people's well being. But in terms of blockbuster, which is typically defined as $1 billion per annum, many are blockbusters, <laughs> you know? So, but here are the facts. I mean, one is if you look consecutively at drug approvals, you just take them as they come off the assembly line, you find that the median improvement in survival of a new cancer drug coming on the market is 2.1 months. So that's the median. So the 50th percentile, I think is about a 2.1 months. At the upper end, maybe the top 10 percentile, the top five percentile, now you're talking about some really transformational drugs. And the single best drug I can think of in the last 30 years took a disease that if you were diagnosed in your 50s, you'd have a life expectancy of three years. Now, just because of one medication, you have a life expectancy that's pretty much normal life expectancy. So that's the best drug. That's Gleevec or Matinib. And that's, to me, what we should be aspiring for. Now, it's okay that not every drug has to be a Gleevec, but 2.1 months, I think, is the median. And I think we can do better than that. Uh, What is Gleevec fight? Gleevec is for chronic myeloid leukemia, chronic myelogenous leukemia, CML, which is a type of blood cancer. It also has some other roles. It's used in stu- a type of rare type of stomach cancer and, uh, and, uh, and some other blood conditions. But 2.1 months is, I mean, <laughs> it's not zero. Uh, and it's certainly not zero for the person in the right-hand tail, although we Correct. don't know exactly how much of the right-hand tail, the longer life expectancy might be due to that person's unique genetic makeup, situation, all kinds of other factors. The, the problem for me is that we give those drugs primacy over drugs that work really remarkably well or quite well. Instead, this works a little bit better. And so suddenly it gets um, the monopoly treatment 
that was created to incentivize the large and long approval process that, that is the reality of, of pharmaceuticals. So, you know, I think if you go back to the earliest episodes of Econ Talk, when I was, I wasn't anything more of a capitalist. I was naive about how the process gets used by the industry. And um, it's very depressing um, that that small improvement often entitles a drug to effectively monopolize the market. And the drug that worked just almost nearly as well uh, is now not subsidized at all and is therefore off the off the table, giving the latest drug uh, essentially monopoly power. Yeah, absolutely. And governments are often by law, particularly in the United States, Medicare is by law required to cover the drugs. A lot of private insurance companies, they are, you know, they're going to cover the drug. They may have certain sort of pathways in place to, to try to minimize that. Even Medicaid is often required to cover cancer drugs because it's thought to be an essential condition. Um, but, you know, Russ, one of the things we didn't mention was we're having this discussion as if we know the number for every drug. But we have to acknowledge, you know, it's only about a third of the drugs that I can actually tell you with some confidence that it's 2.1 months. There's a lot of missing data. And why, listeners may wonder, why is there missing data? Many drugs are developed in the following fashion. I have 60 people with a cancer. They have what we call exhausted earlier drugs. They've had their cancer grow despite having all the drugs we have available. And now we give those 60 people the new drug. And let's say 20 of them live 11 months and have their tumor shrink. And let's say 40 of them, you know, the tumor doesn't shrink and they live eight months. That's the basis for approval. You don't really have a control group. You don't know what would have happened had you just tried something from that you've had in the pharmacy for a few months and there's uncertainty. So I really don't know if they live longer. Recently, we've had a few of these drugs. They finally had what we call the confirmatory randomized study and many of them have failed. One drug, melflufen, was actually had a survival death signal. It looked a little bit worse than what we've been doing before. Another drug did no better then. And people were trying to spin this study saying, well, you know, it's as good as, but it, it wasn't technically a equivalence or non-inferiority randomized trial, which is the kind of statistical proof we need to say as good as. It was a failed superiority study. Um, so I guess the, the other thing I want to tell, point out to your listeners is that, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty here. And that uncertainty benefits the makers of the product. They want the uncertainty because if I, if you're willing to tolerate uncertainty, I can get some drugs through that I otherwise might not be able to. So what we're going to look at a couple actors you identify in your essay that you blame for this problem. Let's start with the FDA. Um, historically, I've said this many times on the program, economists were upset with the FDA because they were so cautious and they were worried about side effects. They're worried about uh, mostly side effects and therefore delayed approval or did not give approval and people died in the meanwhile. And most economists until very recently, that was their main critique of the FDA. But you have a different critique. I do have a different critique, but I also, and I'm kind of curious what you think about it. We could have a few thought experiments. One is we could imagine a total free market in, in the healthcare space, just as there's a free market in the cell phone space where any manufacturer can come to product, can bring a product to the market. And, you know, you'll have more trust in the perhaps the, the Roche, uh, the, you know, the Apple, than you would some, you know, brand you've never heard of. And you might have a system like that. But I think historically, at least in American 20th century, there've been a few seminal events that pulled us away from that model. And the first event was, of course, in the time of Upton Sinclair, where it was the original Food and Drug uh, Safety Act. And that was done largely because we were worried about contamination and even very dangerous products being sold. And so in 1906, we had regulations saying, there should be at least some minimum safety standard for drugs. We can't have mercury and you know syrups given to children or uh, excessive amounts of morphine or our food can't be you know openly defecated on by rats. You know, I mean, we need some basic food drug safety standards. Then fast forward, it wasn't until the 1960s that we had the next big leap in FDA regulation, which was the key for Harris amendments. And that came in the wake of the thalidomide scandal, where really it was sort of one person at the right place at the right time in the US FDA, who prevented us from approving the morning sickness drug, thalidomide, which ended up resulting in being a, a great teratogen and causing you know, the, the thalidomide problem in the United Kingdom, where they didn't have that regulatory arm. And then in the 1960s, we said, look, we'll have safety as we've had, and maybe we'll have some basic efficacy standard. And that's you know, largely been the American sort of path to our current system, where we don't have a free market, we have a regulator, the regulator's job is to 
ostensibly protect average American people from making choices out of desperation that are not really in their best interest. And I think I view that as the philosophical basis for the FDA. I'm sick, I have cancer, I'm not an expert in science. I'm tempted to be charmed by any salesman who could offer me something. And the government steps in and says, we are gonna have some basic standards to make sure they're not selling you snake oil. But what I worry about is in the last 30 years is that they're not doing their job. Because if you are allowing studies without control alarms, if you're allowing studies to be run <coughs> testing the new drug against a drug we haven't given in the United States in 15 years or what I call an inadequate control arm, we've documented this problem. If you allow the drug to measure an endpoint that's not really living longer or living better, but some marker of tumor shrinkage that may or may not perfectly correlate with that, if you allow these kinds of games in the study, you end up creating a bar for companies that makes it difficult for small entrants to jump on the market, makes it easy to sustain lofty prices, but actually doesn't really guarantee that the product works. And that to me is kind of the current system. It's a system that I think benefits large corporations it penalizes the small entrepreneur, and it's meant to keep us healthier and safer, make us have better choices, but I'm not sure it actually fulfills that goal. And I do think that the FDA is the crux of the issue because they're choosing to insert themselves in this process, but they're not doing it in a smart way. Well, I'd say it's the FDA combined with the way we've decided to subsidize healthcare, and particularly drugs. Yes. So I think if you were spending your own money and you had a opportunity to extend your life by a few months. Most people, uh, if it, it would, most people would, would want to know how much money they'd have to spend to get those extra months. And if it was a small amount, they might be willing to do it. If it was an enormous amount, they'd be less willing, don't know how many, et cetera. But I wonder sometimes whether my obsession with trade-offs as an economist clouds my vision here. Many people like the idea, I think, of saying, well, 2.1 months, it's positive. So no matter what the cost of that is, it's worth it. What's your answer to that? I mean, as an economist, I don't agree with that. But as a, as a doctor, how do you answer that? I mean, I, I can even bring it back to the patient in my office. I can imagine, you know, a patient get with, with a certain type of solid cancer. Maybe it's colon cancer. Maybe it's lung cancer. They're going to get a couple of old-fashioned chemotherapy drugs that are known to extend survival. Then let's say a new drug comes on the market, that drug, let's just call it Avastin or Bevacizumab. It's a drug that might add a little bit of survival, something in the 1.5 to 2.5 months sort of survival advantage. But it's going to come at a great cost, $40,000. And I think about that person in my office. A year? Yeah. Oh, well, a, it's a probably, dose? <laughs> probably for the course of treatment, let's just okay. say $40,000. But, but, but per year, I think now something in the seventy to $80,000 ballpark for a year of Avastin. That was when I last checked. But listeners can tell me if I'm, I'm wrong. I wouldn't be surprised if it's higher. Um, the person in my office, what if I went to them and I made the following thing? You know, I said the following, look, you know, you're on these two drugs. They're going to shrink the cancer. They make you feel better. I could add the third drug. It might extend survival a little bit. Does have side effects, more high blood pressure. There's a risk of perforation of, of the bowel slightly higher. Or I could take that money and just give it to you. And you could, or even half, I'll give you half the money, cash. And you can hire somebody to come to your house and help you do the dishes or somebody to drive you to the appointments or somebody to help you keep track of when to take the medicines or somebody just to help you out because you have cancer and it's not so easy to live alone when you have cancer. I'm pretty confident in my practice, the majority of people will take that every day of the week. And, and I will personally take it every day of the week myself too. And so I think you're onto something when you talk about what we've chosen to subsidize. We're subsidizing one thing and not the other. We're subsidizing a, a specific drug that's manufactured at a very low price, that's sold at a very high price. Presumably the value is R&D and that money is transferred to shareholders. And we're not subsidizing the nurse that comes to your house and helps you get out of bed, helps you stay clean, helps you get dressed. We're not subsidizing the person who helps you clean your dishes or do laundry. That's subsidizing a labor force. That's subsidizing lots of people with a lot of, you know, maybe lower, lower middle-class jobs. That's what we're not choosing to subsidize. So we're taking all this societal money in the name of cancer patients. We're choosing to do one thing with it, not the other thing. And I think it's contrary to what people would actually want. And I think it's cynically, it's done to enrich the shareholders who have lobbied for the system that benefits them. I mean, you don't think the person who comes by to help 
person get out of bed? You know, they're not powerful politically in the halls of Congress. I guess not. Um, guess not. Kind of rhetorical question. Sorry, not really fair. <laughs> the other thing, of course, you could do with it is you could leave it to your kids. We could say, here's, here's. By the way, the good news is you're only going to live an extra month or two. It's only forty thousand. It's not eighty or one hundred twenty thousand. But um, to make a really ugly joke, but, but, but it's a serious question. If I give you, if I say and we're, you're going to get two treatments of this, it's eighty thousand dollars. <throat> Um, I could give you half of it and you, you could choose to spend it on care around the house, or you could give it to your grandchildren or your children. Uh, because right now you're taking that money out of their pocket through taxes, not your literal children, but through the generation that's working and funding these programs, you're taking it out of their pocket to get an extra month or two. I think most people would say, I'd be ashamed to do that. Correct. You know, they don't think about it that way. They say, well, the drug's free because, you know, Medicare covers it. They don't think about the fact that someone has to pay for it. And when you remind people that, they get tired of it. You know, it's like, oh, there's no free lunch. But it's really important to remind people because there is no free lunch. And so what you're doing when you take those drugs is you're, you're taxing your children and grandchildren or other people's children and grandchildren to live a few more months. And I think a lot of old people would say, hey, that's not so nice. I completely agree with you. You know, culturally, I think it would be unthinkable, you know, for people and, you know, my parents from India for in, in our culture to to use your money for very marginal gains when you could give it to your children. It would almost be, as we're going to talk about, your duty to give it to your children and you wouldn't, it would be considered selfish to use it on yourself. That's my personal view of it too. You know, that's how I view life as well. Um, and I think you're onto something that the reason this is treated differently is that that's not the trade-off. You don't see that trade-off. You can't leave it to your kids. It's either use it or lose it. You've already been giving up your paycheck for your whole career to the system, the healthcare premiums you've been paying. So why not take advantage of it? And there's nothing else you can do with that money. It's either use it or lose it. And so, you know, we've taken out that trade-off. We've, we've, we've buried it from the person. And if we made it explicit, I think a lot of things would be different. One more thing along these, along these lines, Russ. Um, this is something we're working on. We have the paper under review, but I think you'll find it interesting. Uh, quality of life is now increasingly measured in cancer drug trials. But in these drug trials, the company will give the drug for free in the trial. But in the real world, there are many drugs you get for free, but there's often a little bit of a copay. A copay is not the full value of the drug, but it might be enough to cause some discomfort. Maybe a few hundred. Now the new Biden administration has lowered it to like you know one or two thousand dollars per year. But for a while it was about seven thousand, eight thousand, nine thousand a year, which can cause some difficulty in the lives of many people. And I always thought it was interesting that the quality of life you're measuring is quality of life when you get it for free, but the quality of life in the real world is quality of life when you got to pay nine thousand dollars a year for that. And that might not be the same thing because when you have to start paying your own money into it. Your quality of life is, as many studies show, it's going to go down. You're going to have a real reduction in quality of life. And so the trial is not really measuring quality of life, the construct in the real world. It's measuring quality of life in this mythical world where people give you this product for free. And I think that would, that's inaccurate. That's the, sort of the theme of our paper. And the other thing I think we need to think about, and it doesn't really um, mesh very well with the sausage factory of politics, but in theory, it's a lovely idea that the elderly are treated with respect and dignity, and we we would we should say two months of an old person's life might mean they get to go to the wedding of a grandchild, and that's not unimportant. The problem I have is that I don't think that's the motivation for the for this uh, this kind of of drug intervention. And as we point out, there are, both of us agree. There are many, many better ways to honor the elderly rather than saying we're going to devote an enormous portion of our government budget to making sure that you get access to the very latest drug. By the way, in the abstract, that's a great idea. The problem is it changes the incentives for drug companies, and, and that's often hard to remember. I mean, I think about that, what you're talking about. I mean, I think it's a very important point, respect and honoring the elderly. And I think about all the ways in which the modern cancer system dishonors them. It dishonors them by giving them appointments at the crack of dawn that are inflexible. It dishonors them by making them come to these you know, huge cancer mecca hospitals and try to find parking in a cramped parking garage. And then they have to come and sit in the plastic chair and wait for the appointment and maybe the doctor's not running on time. 
then they have to go back to their house and keep track of this heavy infusion schedule, come in, get delays and spend six hours a day, you know, waiting in the chair. And then they go home and there's nobody to help them with their dishes or to help them get dressed or to help them around their house. That's a type of dishonor. I mean, you're honoring them because you're giving them the lucrative pharmaceutical product, but you're dishonoring them because their life is a lot more difficult than it would be had you actually invested that money in just making the whole experience, I think, better. Maybe the doctor could come visit you or a nurse practitioner could visit you some days. Maybe we can come to your house and hang the infusion, which is what very wealthy people in this country get done. Maybe we can make the whole process of coming to the hospital a little bit more convenient for you. But we don't seem to be thinking about any of those things. We're thinking about the latest one-month drug. Are we being too harsh here? Is it really the case that these are one-month drugs, two-month drugs? And as you say, we don't know it in advance. Um, you could argue we should have a better idea in advance of what we're what we're subsidizing, but are we being a little too cynical here? Or are you being a little too cynical? Of the <laughs> I mean, yes, because I think we're focusing on the 50th percentile and not the 90th percentile. Let's talk about the 90th percentile. I think there are, I mean, let's just talk about the good side of this, this whole system. The system does develop good drugs. There are people who come in, not everybody, but a few people who would have been dead had it not been for last year's drug that's keeping them alive. And they are people who have really good outcomes with individual drugs who are on that tail of the distribution, who do really well. And there is an excitement to innovation. I mean, even if the innovation is mixing pseudo innovation and real innovation, it's exciting to be in a field that has something new. And when the field has nothing new for decades, I think it's hard to recruit the best talent. So by seeing all this innovation and all this excitement, all these job prospects, we are recruiting better people. And so I do think there is an upside to this system. I don't dispute that. And I'm grateful for these new drugs. I think the question boils down to what's the balance of efficiency and waste? It, you know, there is waste, these mediocre drugs or these drugs that may not add anything. And there are transformational drugs. Are we in the sweet spot or could we move to a sweeter spot? And I think that's really what we should be talking about. Yeah. So if we were in a real free market where people spent their own money, uh, as I suggested, many people would not be willing to spend an enormous amount of money to extend their life by a small number of years. They'd rather spend it on something else to make the remaining months more pleasant. They might leave it to their children, their grandchildren. But but that's that's how the that's how the trade off would work. You'd make your own call. Richer people might be more willing to uh, take a chance on a drug that was less certain, and so on. But we don't have that system. We're not close to it. Remotely close to it. So how would we possibly, how should we possibly think about uh, what we should allow in, um, in terms of innovation that we, that we do subsidize? You know, we've had Robin Feldman on the program talking about how generics are penalized, the various shenanigans that are, that are played by the, by the industry. But just putting that to the side, how, how would we, how should, who wants to, who could make that trade-off? And we've made it in one direction. And it's unidirectional. Yeah. Anything yes. that extends life in a clinical trial, we'll we'll subsidize it and we'll we'll punish the the its predecessors and and privilege the newcomer. What's the alternative? I mean, I guess I guess I'd say a couple of thoughts. One is that I think I think there are many economists who believe sincerely that if you didn't have a system that reimbursed so well for those marginal drugs, then you would have less transformational drugs created per annum. Maybe. Maybe. There are other people who on the other side of the spectrum, which I, I kind of put myself in. And again, I also probably will admit I'm on shaky ground here. Like neither of us have rock solid evidence of our beliefs. But I believe that if you raise the bar for drug approval, you approve fewer drugs, made companies aspire for greater benefits, they would prune their, their R&D pipeline like a bonsai tree. I mean, they will, re, they will aggressively prune that pipeline. They'll be much wiser about what they pursue. They're not dumb people. They're smart people. They know that some of these things are likely to be marginal and some of these things are likely to be transformational. They'll change that. I think you'll roughly get the same amount of transformational drugs per year because I don't think the constraint is just, you know, tossing more capital in the fire. I think the constraint is biological constraint, the constraint of like, you know, do we even know what the targets are? Do we even know sort of the ways in which we could interdict upon biology? Um, but that's also a belief. I think, I mean, there are many, many papers on this topic, you know, retrospective looking at, you know, innovation and biomedical and science, but they're all really limited. I mean, they're limited by, we're, they're all constrained by the world we live in, and they're all constrained by small sample size, 200 drugs over 10 years sort of sample sizes. And so, you know, neither one of us knows for sure which one of our worldview is right. I would say, 
I think what makes this market unique is society has made a choice. And that choice is we're going to provide health care. We're going to tax everybody to provide a societal good. Some people will call that we believe in a right to health care. Others will call that, you know, we believe that this is something, a shared value. Um, we do it the same way we do roads and we do schools. Health care is one of those things. And all I would say, the, 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 weak, the weak position, I'll argue a stronger position, but the weak position I think is you can't tax everybody and pay for things that in aggregate don't work. And so if there's a drug like melflufen, this is a real drug. They took a drug from the 1960s and they added a little molecule to the side. I think many of us knew off the bat, it's not going to be that innovative. It's a modification of an older drug. They brought it to the market because they gave it in an uncontrolled study to people with myeloma. And we know the parent drug shrinks myeloma and this shrank myeloma in some fraction of people. Then finally, they do a randomized control trial against the weakest acceptable control arm they could think of. Not what I would do in my clinic, but what I might have done seven years ago or what might be done in, you know, Hungary or Romania where they're running this study. They're picking literally the weakest arm that the FDA will allow them to get away with in a randomized study. Then they have no survival benefit. In fact, the hazard ratio trends towards harm. In other words, it, if anything, it might be harmful. And the company was asked to withdraw the product from the U.S. market. They, they put up, you know, hurdle after hurdle. They find some subgroup that it, they think it works better with. The FDA, you know, mocks them at their own public hearing and says, look, people in May, they had a survival advantage, but people enrolled in June didn't. So just to show that, you know, you keep splicing and dicing a randomized trial, you're going to find these spurious things. This is the system we're living in. And what I would suggest is multiple myeloma. How would I have solved this problem? There are, you know, 10 or 15 different active drugs in myeloma. There are many combinations you can give and you can combine drugs that previously worked and give them again and they can work again. And I would say that this is a system, this is a, and people live median survival is like seven to 10 years. It's not a space where you should approve drugs based on uncontrolled studies. We can wait for the answer. We don't have to shell out hundreds of millions of dollars on uncertain drugs. We can just make, have a bar that says, look, if your new drug improves survival over, you know, a real standard of care we're doing in America, we'll approve it. And if not, no, not the current system of if your new drug shrinks the tumor, which is a much lower bar. And then I'd say that what you're talking about is raising the bar even further. Why accept any statistical improvement in survival? Maybe it should be three months or four months or five months or six months, something that patients think is meaningful. And I actually am close to that position. I, I would support that. Um, but where we're starting from is so far beneath that, that you can get a drug approved if it shrinks the cancer in the bloodstream of somebody and you don't even know if they live longer. And in this case, they didn't live longer. They would have lived longer had we never had the drug. Uh, arguably. I mean, I think that that's the reality of where we are. And so to me, that speaks to a very broken system that we're using taxpayer money to pay for something that might've even hurt people over not even having it on the market. That's, that's where we are. And of course the challenge is, you know, who makes that decision? Should it be four months, six months, a year? There's very little accountability in those kind of decisions that are made. They're not made at the ballot box. They're not made by people appointed, by people who went through the ballot box. They're just uh, so-called experts. Um, and, you know, every country does it differently. I'm living in Israel. I'm sure I don't, will not have access to many cancer drugs here because it's it's paid for by the government uh, uh, or subsidized by the government dramatically, and they make arbitrary decisions. And And the results of that system, by the way, is that there's not much pro as much profit here in Israel, um, or in France, <laughs> or in England, or in Romania, right. and the United States taxpayer is funding all the innovation. Yeah, some of it good, some of it not. Um, and you know, I pay very little money for my blood pressure medicine here, uh, and sometimes I feel good about that, but most of the time I feel guilty because well, I. I paid my share when I was an American citizen for a long time, I guess. But I, again, it's it's the um, the non-free lunch that's not easily observed. An enormous portion of the profitability in the in the drug market comes from the unconstrained pricing uh, that Medicare is, pays for. That uh, comes out of the pocket of American taxpayers. That benefits people all over the world because they get a different price 
And that drug wouldn't exist without that enormous uh, opportunity in America to make a lot of money. So that is also part of the story. Yeah, that's the part of the story that I think makes, you know, you said, are we being too cynical? That's the part of the story to keep in mind. You know, but one of the things we haven't mentioned is the tone of my article. Uh, the tone of my article is it's, uh, it's, it's, it's melancholy. I mean, it's a sad article. Um, you know, it's written from a place of pain. And, you know, I, I mentioned the article, I was on vacation and I had a, just a lot of distance from the day to day. And what was, what, what was I sad about? Uh, it wasn't the pharmaceutical industry. And I think that's the thing that I want to make clear to your listeners. Oh, the best lectures I've ever given are the pharmaceutical industry. They're the best audience. They're the most engaged. I would say the vast majority of people who work at the pharmaceutical industry, not only are they brilliant, but they're also, what you know, their heart's in the right place. They really want to make better drugs for people. Um, that's never where I put the criticism, because to me, that's like criticizing the tiger for being the tiger. You know, their job is, their fiduciary job is a duty to their shareholders. They are taking advantage of the system as it is. What can I, what can I say about the tiger? It is a tiger. It's the nature of the, the animal. The place I'm really sad about are the other parts of the, that we talk, that I talk about in the essay. One is the FDA. Why am I sad there? We just had Congress investigate the FDA over Biogen's aducanumab, which is their Alzheimer's drug. And the congressional report, which was published in Wall Street Journal about a week, week and a half ago, shows a pattern of coordination and, uh, uh, and, and, and I want to choose my word carefully, um, uh, a close relationship between FDA and Biogen as they brought a very disputed product to market, despite a negative advisory committee vote. Their own advisor said, don't do it. They still brought it to market in a very cozy relationship with many improprieties. And the report is a scathing report of the FDA's conduct during that drug process. And I always point out to people, this is the drug we investigate. We don't investigate every drug. So for most of the drugs, you don't know what the conduct was between the two groups. And so the reason I fault the FDA so much is I think like so many regulatory agencies, they are being captured. They are increasingly seeing their duty what is their duty? Their duty is to the American people, but they see their duty as a duty to their client and their client is the company. How can I help this company whose heart's in the right place, get their product to market as quickly and painlessly as possible? But that's not their duty. Their duty is to the American people. And sometimes that means telling the company the hard news that, you know, I'm sorry, you're not going to come to this market. And why are, what are all the sort of the systemic factors there? I think that the, the one systemic factor is that, um, a tiny and vocal minority can always defeat a large disinterested majority. It's hard to think about the American people and what they need. It's easy to think about the Biogen people. They're in your office. They're in the waiting room. <laughs> yeah, they're knocking on the door. Um, that's one. Two, I think the job opportunities. You go to work at the FDA and, you know, that's a job that's unfortunately underpaid and maybe undervalued. But, you know, in five years of FDA experience on your CV, you're going to go work for Biogen. You're going to go work for Genentech. And in fact, we published a paper in British Medical Journal where we show the majority of people who leave FDA as medical reviewers go to work for consult for pharma. It shouldn't be surprising. That's their skill set. But it is a revolving door. Scott Gottlieb is commissioner, and now he's on the board of directors of Pfizer. Okay. Um, that to me is a structural problem. It tells me that, you know, if I'm if I knew very that I'm going to have a huge chance of working at the University of Pittsburgh, I'm going to take it easy on University of Pittsburgh when I read about, you know, whatever they're doing in their local marketplace. Um, so that's you, why I go ahead. And you also pick on, um, or melancholy, I'll say, about yeah. uh, academics and, yeah, and people in academia. So what's the issue there? I guess I think that's absolutely true, including the younger generation, which we can come to last, maybe. That's what made that's what made me this that's what made my heart break the most. I was always optimistic the young ones, the younger ones would fix these problems, but I think that they're just falling along the same lines. But why academics? You know, I do worry that the modern American university, because it's been so starved of state funding and so starved of sort of societal funding, has forgotten that the goal of a university, in my mind, is scholarship, debate, and preserving knowledge and pushing new ideas and having a, a freedom to pursue these ideas in a, in a, in a contentious but fair and, and I think respectful environment. I think they've forgotten that whole mission and universities now, their sole mission is finding ways to keep their revenues up in times of shifting, uh, shifting state funding. So for instance, you can walk around campuses, my own university, the, the name of the lecture hall is Genentech Hall. That's the lecture hall. You know, Many universities are entering into partnerships with pharmaceutical companies where we're selling our IP 
And we're building, you know, facilities on our campus that are joint ventures where we're going to manufacture some products like CAR-T therapy together. We're going to work hand in hand. If you're an academic oncologist, I'm an exception because I'm in epidemiology and that's sort of a different hat I wear. But the average academic oncologist, what is their job? You see patients a little bit a week and then you run clinical trials for pharmaceutical companies. You are enrolling patients on their trial, some of which you might've had a little bit of a say in, but many of which you're just following the, the recipe that the baker sent you and you're just following through. We have a huge exodus of academic oncologists to pharma. People always wonder why, why, why? I say, they, they were working for pharma when they worked for you too. They just changed, you know, you're already working for pharma. You're just now explicitly working for pharma and you're getting stock options and maybe a little bit better pay, better hours. So that's why you're moving. Um, we've forgotten, I think, scholarship and teaching. If you write a paper critical of a pharmaceutical product, it's very tough for you. I know many people who say, I can't say, I agree with you. Listen to your podcast on whatever drug. I agree with you, but I got to go to the company on Monday and have a meeting about a trial I want to run. I cannot say anything. I can't even like it on Twitter. Because I can't even like it. I want to like it, but I can't like it. Um, that to me is what I find tragic, that the universities increasingly see collaboration with pharma as a very lucrative opportunity, and they're pursuing it so doggedly that this idea that we'll serve as a check or balance or be critical of them, I think that's falling by the wayside. And you can count on one hand the number of academic oncologists who are critical of this system, uh, which to me is shocking because I would think everyone would be critical of the system. Uh, but, you know, you, you do want to run trials. You want to be part of the system <clears throat> in some dimension, at least what you hope is a system that will produce truth. <clears throat> it's currently run through, funded by, subsidized by pharmaceutical companies. How has this affected you personally, though? I mean, is it, is it, is your salary lower? You're, you're still, no, it's a serious question. You're, I'm watching you on YouTube, but you know, on Zoom, but <laughs> um, does it hurt your salary? Does it increase your chances of, of being fired? Um, why is, what's the nature of the pressure? That, that you're invoking here? So for me personally, I think the answer is um, because I'm not in the Department of Medical Oncology and I'm in the Department of Epidemiology, which I find a better place to put my criticisms. And in part also, I think they are statistical and epidemiologic criticisms, but also it's a shielded place because I'm not directly in the fire of oncology. Is my salary less? The answer is yes. I mean, I think we have public payments. We have public, you can look up anyone's salary in the department. Uh, probably I would make $100,000 more if I was in the oncology department because they're paid higher. I mean, that's just the nature of the market. Um, and they would probably make several hundred thousand dollars more if they went to private practice uh, or, or, or 100,000 more if they went to the pharmaceutical industry directly. Um, sure, so that's true. Uh, obviously, as we'll come to in the second essay, money is not really what I believe is the motivating force of life, it's duty, you know, and so we'll talk about that. Um, so that doesn't bother me as much. I think... Um, you know, there are certainly times where somebody says, we wanted you to be the keynote speaker at a conference. We wanted you to be a grand round speaker, but you took a really hard stance on insert drug X. And, you know, there's a lot of discontent on the committee and people are like, oh, you can't, you can't have him here. You were too hard on that trial. Uh, so that's definitely happened to me. Not, not that I'm complaining. I'm not, I'm not looking for more speaking. If it, you know, I travel enough, I want to cut that down, but okay. You know, but that is a repercussion. And one thing I don't do is I don't personally spend my time running the trials myself. Uh, when I was, a, you know, in the past, I've enrolled many patients on trials. Um, I've even drafted some, you know, like we do in our training. But I don't make that a portion of my career, in part because we all have limited time. You know, we have to choose what we want to do. I want to work on books and I want to work on some writing and I want to do some other stuff. Um, but for people who wanted to have a foot in both camps, they want to work with the companies and also be critical of the companies. It's the hardest path to trod. I know many people who were doing this kind of critical work. And then there came a moment in their career, often very early, where they decided they have to lose one or the other. And they've chosen, you know, I'm just going to stop all the policy work I'm doing. I'm going to focus on just running the trials. And I know some junior people who are struggling to find the balance. And I suspect it's a, it's a difficult balance. So the pressure, I think, is peer pressure. The pressure is your boss will talk to you. I know many people who say, you know, the company called the cancer center director and said, why do you have a faculty member talking ill about our products? You know, I think that's a pressure. Um, the, and uh, yeah, and, and then the pressure to find your salary, even though we work at university, 
you know, I'm a small business owner. I'm looking for myself. I'm like a Mary Kay salesman trying to find people to give me some money to do some research, you know? So I think that's a pressure. You know, it's, um, I, you know, I disagree with what you think is, is the driving force behind this. I, I, I don't think it's a lack of funding at the, at the government level, if anything, sure. the funding of government of the university system over the last 50 years in America has made academic life dramatically more lucrative than it was in, say, 1950, 1960, 1970, somewhere around mm -hmm. 1970 or 80. You could really make a lot of money as an academic. It's not a sacrifice. True. It's a little sacrifice relative to uh, industry sometimes, as you alluded to, but, but fundamentally, um, it's hard to, it's hard to admit it, but you've laid it out very beautifully. It used to be that universities cared about truth and, um, it got too expensive and, uh, pharmaceutical industry is one place where that's the case, but there are a lot of places, you know, I, I used to joke that, you know, the, the number of economists who think they could be chair of the Fed someday is enormously large. They, you know, about half the macroeconomists in America think they're in the top 10%. So they think they got a shot someday at chair of the Fed. So they never say anything critical to the Fed. And um, that's the same sort of corruption. It's not, not literal corruption. It's, it's just a subtle mm -hmm. corrosion of values that... Um, that money can do if you're not careful. And the system has evolved, the academic system, the grant system in general from the government, whether it's in medicine or elsewhere, to reward people who play by the rules rather than seek the truth. And, um, you know, people have a lot of romance about academic life. Those of us in the kitchen um, don't have the same level of romance. I think you're so right, Russ. I think you're hitting on a big thing, which is that they're thinking about the next career step and the next career step, and they want to keep quiet as well. But I always tell people that, you know, when I look back on my field, and I don't know how you feel about economics, I'm very curious. When I look back on oncology and I read, you know, I like to read papers from the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, and I have my own heroes. And not a single one of my heroes is a person who kept quiet because they wanted to be dean someday. All of my heroes were the people who pushed on issues that were hard. And some of the greatest heroes in oncology, I think, were incredibly controversial in their times. There's this guy, Bernie Fisher. He was the reason why women get a lumpectomy rather than half their chest wall removed. You know, the old way they would remove the breast and the pec major, pec minor. And how did he do that? He ran a randomized trials that randomized people to the big barbaric surgery or lesser surgery. That showed the barbaric surgery was no better than another study to even a lesser surgery. And in the course of a couple of randomized studies, he moved us from barbaric Halstead paradigm to lumpectomy. And the history books say when he gave lectures, people would shout out murderer, you know, you're murdering women. And they'd curse him out and they'd insult him. Uh, you know, the, the, I mean, he was, he was vilified by a lot of his fellow colleagues. Uh, he withstood it and he pushed on an issue. Um, it might have hurt him professionally a little bit. I mean, maybe he could have accomplished, you know, he would have been promoted higher. Uh, but he's a hero of mine. And, you know, not to even put, you know, what we're doing is not the same, you know, what I don't claim that, you know, thinking about policy is the same thing, but I think anybody who does courageous science, it's going to ruffle some feathers. And if you're not ruffling any feathers, you got to ask yourself, what are you trying to, what are you doing as a scientist? Are you really pushing on it? Um, and life is short. You know, I think we'll both agree. I feel like I started faculty, you know, a minute ago and it's been eight years, you know, and time is going faster than I would have liked it to go. Uh, and you want to do something in your 25 years in academics or 30 years. You don't get forever. Um, you want to do something of meaning. And I think that means you have to forget about yourself a little bit and just push as hard as you can sometimes. Well, let's turn to the question you mentioned a couple of times already, which is the question of duty. You wrote a really, it's a screed, but yeah. it, it deserves to be a screed. I think that duty is out of fashion. Um, it isn't what motivates most people. Um, you write, our ancestors used to know what that word means, but in the modern world, it has fallen out of, it has fallen out of favor. It's been replaced with weakness and cowardice, narcissism and careerism. And I think duty's definitely out of favor. You've all been in a very nice book, uh, A Time to Build, talks about how 
most people use their platform, whatever they have, as a, whether it's an academic platform or a government platform, for uh, self-aggrandizement, for building up themselves, for what he calls performative opportunities to perform, to be seen, to attract attention, to get followers, rather than to do the right thing. And why did that happen? <laughs> uh, hmm. Before I, that's a tougher question, but let's talk about why you wrote an essay about that uh, in the medical field. We, you've just given a couple examples from the cancer field, uh, but most of this essay was related to the pandemic. Yeah. So I got to give one piece of background to you that you may not know. The essay is very harshly worded. And why was I feeling emotionally that way? The essay was written. I think one or two days or three days after the Uvalde massacre, those kids in the classroom. And in my mind, that broke me. I'll tell you, be honest with you, Russ. It broke me because, you know, we've become so desensitized to school shootings, and I don't think we should be. I think it's something we should be sensitized to, and they always break me. I mean, I think that it's unthinkable. And, you know, I understand how so many people feel about how horrible that is. So that always breaks me. This broke me extra because they stood in the hallway for one hour while those kids were shot over and over and over again. And the shots were spread out in time and there were hundreds of them armed right outside that door. And they didn't break down that door and go in. And, you know, there's been countless sort of- You're, you're talking about the secure, the police the or those- yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, the cops. They failed in their duty. There's a duty of being a cop. And that duty is, even if you're scared, even if your colleague was shot, these kids are in the classroom, you got to break down that door. And honestly, it doesn't matter to me what your bosses are telling you on the radio. You're the ones there. You have a duty. And they didn't go in. And I can't think of what that would be like. Because there's so many times in healthcare, somebody tells me, you can't do something, Dr. Prasad. That's against the rule. You know, that, the patient, you know, we can't do that. There's no pay to pay. And, you know, I always find a way to break the rule. You know, I don't know if people should know. I always break the rule. Because if it's right for my patient, that's my duty. And I'm sorry, I don't, you know, you may cut the check at the end of the day, but I don't really work for you. I work for that patient. And so I will break the rule. I'll bend the rule. I've become an expert in doing this. And this is my small space, but that's what I've chosen to do with my life. They've chosen to be a cop. And I think you got to run in that room a hundred times out of a hundred. You got to run in that room right away. And you got to kick down that door. And if you hear the gunshots, you got to go in. And so that, that was my emotional state writing that essay. I was broken by that. I try not to comment too much about things outside of my wheelhouse of biomedicine but that was my emotional state. And to me, it's different, it's, but it is an abdication of duty, which is that so many academics don't participate in the big topics of the day. I think that, that was, that's kind of what I'm talking about in the sense of duty of, of our line of work. Um, you know, you're a great person who's had conversations with people on so many topical issues, policy issues, you're an exception. I think that mentality you kind of alluded to in, in the last part of your comments about the, the careerist academic judging very carefully, what topics should I even talk about? That's a mindset that's pervasive in the academy, people trying to get that next position. To me, one of the examples I give in the essay is I know many people, they've spent their career devoted to educational outcomes in underrepresented minority populations. They care about Black, Hispanic, inner city kids and their educational outcomes. And during COVID-19, on the issue of prolonged school closure, particularly in liberal cities, they did not say a word publicly. And to me, you know, I, I can't imagine what that's like. That's, you live for that issue. That's your moment to shine and go in and say what you know and participate. And you might not be right, but you gotta get in there. That's your, that's your debate to be had. Um, I got in that debate. That's not my debate to be had. I'm an oncologist, but, you know, that's, but even I got in the debate because I knew it was so important and I felt strongly about the issue. And that to me is a similar, you know, standing outside the door moment in someone's career. Yeah, I, I think about it a lot. Um, I think about a, a lot of the, the reason that that school shooting is is so um, salient as an example is because most of the time the stakes are small. You know, yeah. you might not get a promotion. You might not get put on the committee you want to get put on. You might not be able to run that clinical trial. This is life and death. This isn't yeah. small stakes. 
And this is the test. And those people failed the test, tragically. Um, and you could argue that a successful society honors people who run toward danger, not away from it. We all understand why you want to run away from danger. We, you know, it, it's in certain sense, you can't judge anybody for not risking their life to save another person. But you can judge them when that's what they signed up for. And you don't have to sign up for it. Um, that's the deal. Um, and it's hard to run toward danger. I'm not sure I've ever had to face that choice myself. So I don't want to, it's hard for me to judge those those people. But when you sign up for it, that's the deal. And in many ways, it's what makes up a life well lived is duty, honor, fulfilling your obligations. And all of those things, honor, duty, fulfilling your obligations, they're all a little bit out of fashion. Um, yeah. You said falling out of favor. They've also fallen out of fashion. They're, they're not, we don't make movies so much about them anymore. We don't instill them in our children through hagiography and, and myth of, of heroes. We, we're much more eager to tear our heroes down, at least in the United States. And um, something deep is lost there. Yeah, that's really well put. And I think you're you're saying what I wished I could articulate as nicely as that, which is, you know, we're taking Lincoln off the high school name because he wasn't good enough. He didn't do enough good things. We're not respecting our heroes. We're not teaching people a sense of duty. Everything's about how you feel and how it makes you feel, not what is your obligation in life. And that that school shooting broke me. I think I cried in my car when I was listening to, you know, the the news coverage of that. And why did it break me? It broke me because, as you say, it was the most important thing. It's life or death. It's children behind that door. And yes, you signed up for it. And, you know, when you sign up for a job like that, that's the risk that comes. Um, and you got to go in. That's the moment you were trained for. Um, I think about it a little bit in healthcare. I allude to it a little bit. It's not the same. Uh, but when the pandemic hit, you found me. I was in the middle of switching jobs, but by, you know, the peak pandemic, early summer, 2020, um, I'm back in clinic every day. Or, I mean, I'm back in clinic every week, seeing patients. Um, they gave you a thin, you know, surgical mask. Why was I there? Uh, it's my duty. Could I have got, I'm much more likely to get COVID than had I just said, you know, oh, don't, you know, don't schedule any patients or I'll just do Zoom visits. But, you know, people's cancer is not stopping growing. And so we have to go do our job. And I don't want to pretend I'm the only one, you know, most healthcare people did go back in there. And I think some of us who went back and worked in person have a very different perspective than some of the reporters who covered COVID from the luxuries of their, you know, behind Zoom and from their apartments. I think that's one perspective that is different. Um, and I think that that is lost because there are many rotations where they said, you know, I was told that, oh, you know, the residents can't come because it's, you know, it's not. It's too high risk to go have a resident see the COVID patient. Uh, and, you know, that to me is an unthinkable thing to say, because when you're a doctor, that's what you signed up for. Um, I remember as a resident, I had to sew in, you know, uh, lines and put needles into patients who are like HIV positive, uncontrolled HIV. Uh, it's a risk you could cut yourself, uh, but it's a risk you take because that's what it means to have the job. Um, and many of us have nicked ourselves or stuck ourselves and, you know, we've had to deal with that. Um, I do think that's lost. And I'm not sure where that decline comes from, but I do think we are so singularly focused on our happiness, our immediate gratification and ourselves. We forget that duty often means it, it comes at some cost to you. It's often towards others. Uh, it's not about yourself. And I think it is something more important and what life is really about is fulfilling your duty. I don't pretend to know everyone's duty, um, but I think you have to figure out your duty and you have to doggedly pursue it, even if it hurts. To try to give some insight into how we've come to this point in much of the Western world, I think I just unintentionally learned something about myself, right? You told a story about Cowardice, because that's really what it's about. Here are a group of people whose obligation was to take a risk, and they failed. They stayed in the hallway and hoped it would go away and that they would not have to pay a price for it. So in commenting on that, do you notice what I said? 
I didn't think about it. I said, you know, it's hard for me to judge them. And I think we live in this strange time where we're incredibly critical and one very small mistake can ruin a person's life through the public response to it. At the same time, we're very uncomfortable shaming people for their lack of duty. We're much more likely to say, as I said, parenthetically, yeah, not that I would judge any, you know, it's hard for me to judge someone, you know, in that situation, because I worry that in that situation, I might've done the same thing. And, you know, were it my cousin, I like to think I would still invite them to, to my house to break bread, even if I feel they had failed. But as a culture and a society, that's not a very healthy attitude. <laughs> and, you know, I think a lot about Adam Smith. Um, you know, Adam Smith says basically the reason we do things for other people is because we want to be judged favorably and respected. And we want other people whose respect we crave to respect us. And we want to be praiseworthy and not just praised, but praiseworthy. And that's out of fashion. You know, that's what's out of fashion. The willingness to judge other people, to impose a cost of shame, uh, intolerance, judgmental, a judgmental attitude is totally out of our culture in many settings. Not all. Because in other settings, it's it runs rampant. It's a certain weird uh, aspect of modern life for me when I think about it. But, you know, we tolerate lots of bad behavior. We see things around us that are shameful, and we stay silent. Uh, we don't judge them publicly. We don't criticize them publicly. So I salute you for that essay. Uh, in passing, you defend uh, past econ talk guest Emily Oster, who spoke yeah. out very bravely and publicly against school closure and took an immense amount of vilification for it. Yeah. But most of the time, People just put their head down and they, they let other people um, just rather not say anything. Uh, they, they leave it alone. And that's our culture to a large extent, at least in a face-to-face -face way. Not in social media. Obviously, it's very, very different. But in face-to-face -face culture, I see you do something shameful. A lot of times I'll just keep quiet. Um, I like to think not I personally, but I think a lot of times I do and we do. We just say, well, I don't know what that person's going through. And there's certain... Nice thing about that in a certain way, but kids died. And it's not nice. Yeah. I think, I mean, you're onto something that I think it's difficult to sometimes articulate how you feel about somebody failing their duty. And maybe I'll give you an example of one where recently that occurred that I haven't articulated that I, I think we're, we're on the wrong track. Um, I think medicine is a, is a field where one of the things you got to teach trainees, so it doesn't matter how you feel that day, the person coming in your office, it's, they're often having a worse day. I mean, they're dealing with a very important medical problem in their life. It might be the life limiting medical problem. You might've had something happen in the morning. You might have something happening this evening. Often it'll pale in comparison to what they have going on. Uh, that's one. And two, you have a duty. You know, the duty is to be there and you got to do your best job. You got to forget everything. And sometimes we are, this duty changes all the time. I move from a room where I have to tell someone, you know, there's nothing we can do and we might have to go on hospice to move to a room where you tell someone you cured them. I mean, they're very likely to be cured. And so you have to constantly be changing and wearing these different hats. And I do worry our medical training is, is drifting away from this and we're sort of rewarding different values that I'm not sure I agree with. I'll just give you one example. Um, we had maybe about a year and a half ago at the height of the George Floyd protests, there was a shooting in Kenosha, Wisconsin. I think Jacob Blake was uh, the gentleman who was shot. He was unarmed um, by the police. And of course, I categorically disagree with shooting unarmed men. You know, the police should never shoot an unarmed black man. I, you know, I think that that's wrong. Uh, it, that's not an easy, that's an easy thing to persuade me of, okay? That, you know, the police can be exuberant in their force and they ought not be and they need better training or I, I don't know how to solve it. it's not my expertise I won't I won't even pretend to try to solve it but I do think it's a problem um I got a memo or something that said the school is going to be closed for a week our medical school and the memo and you know I was kind of confused what was the basis of the school closure um and the answer was that you know the the faculty or the administrators felt like some of the students might be so upset about the events of Jacob Blake that they need a break from medical school and I strongly disagree. I still disagree. 
that that's not what we should be teaching our students. Because if I'm the trauma surgeon and some guy's wheeled in and he's exsanguinating and somebody tells me the cop shot him, he's unarmed, you know, it's going to be a bad thing if I stop doing my job all of a sudden. I need to be ready to do my job, no matter what they tell me about this person or what happened to them. And that's medicine. You know, you might not be feeling perfect. You might be feeling upset, but you got to do your job because someone's life's on the line. And I think rewarding or not rewarding, but just giving people a week off, it's it's absolutely unacceptable in my mind. And and if we're doing this for the shooting, there could be a shooting a week for the rest of the year. I mean, this is not an infrequent occurrence. And so will we give the whole year off or when will they become learn how to be doctors? I know there's another trend where I know people are saying that we got to give so many mental health days to residents. I say, I totally agree. It's a stressful time. We have to think about ways to make medical training more humane and less stressful. But I'm not sure the right idea is to let people have a bank of days where they can just declare, I don't feel like being a doctor today. Because there are many days where, you know, I'm having a tough day, but I have a duty. And we have to teach people, you got to follow your duty. And so these kinds of cultural changes in the academy, this didn't exist when I was a student. I'm not that old. Um, and I'm not sure the best way to, who to go talk to, who is actually capitulating to this culture. I mean, who's making these decisions? I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, but that's a decision that, you know, so many faculty tell me they disagree with these decisions in our school, but nobody is in any position to say anything or, and they feel uncomfortable saying something because they don't want to be labeled as, you know, the person who opposed giving the students a week off or, you know, that sort of thing. And I think that's part of this problem that's linked to this duty problem. Yeah, I think about you sitting in your car crying and you know, we all have days where things go wrong at home, things go wrong with our own bodies, things... Yeah mental issues, stress. Um, we don't feel 100%. Uh, most of the time we don't feel 100%. <laughs> um, and a culture that says, if you don't feel 100%, you can get, you can sit it out. It's going to generate a certain set of results as opposed to a culture that says, you have an obligation to overcome whatever's on your mind. Now, we understand that to go through life at certain times under great emotional stress and, quote, pretending that everything is fine is, is, is not a road to health. But I think some of it is definitely the privileging of our our day-to-day -day well-being, which, you know, I've argued is a little bit overrated. Uh, there are many, many things more important than our day-to-day well-being, our, our dignity, our pride, our principles, fill in the blank, and in your case, uh, our conversation, your duty. And um, we're much more likely to coddle people um, for better for us. And how old are you, Vinay? 40. 40. Mm -hmm. I'm 68. So when I say it, it's like, oh, that old codger. And he's cranky and he longs for the good old days. You're too young to be put in that category. <laughs> um, although you may have an old soul, I suspect you do. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, but I think the way you articulated that is exactly how I feel, which is that I think a value is that even when you're not feeling 100%, you need to go there and give 100%. And I think that that is something for, especially in medicine, it is so important um, because there's, there's not going to be someone to cover for you. That's what I want to tell these students someday. You know, I have patients I've seen for years um, and there's a conversation that needs to be had on Tuesday, for instance. And if I'm not there for that conversation, you can't, there's nobody you can pull in. There's nobody who knows this person. There's nobody who's had this relationship with, there's nobody they want to hear it from other than you. There's nobody to cover for you. So it doesn't matter, you know, I always tell you, you're going to find me there. It doesn't matter how I'm feeling. Doesn't matter what happened to me. I'm going to be there. Um, and, you know, somebody, somebody recently said, I think th this culture expands in so many directions, but I told somebody I'm going to meet them for dinner at some place in time. And they said, you know, just so you know, like if you're going to cancel, um, you know, you got to give me 24 hour notice to cancel the reservation. And I got, and I tell them, frankly, I was like, I, I, I will not cancel. I do not cancel and I will be there at that date and time, you know, because I made a commitment to you and I'm going to show up. I, you know, nothing's going to get in the way of that. And so do not worry about that, you know, but but the fact they have to ask that it speaks to the culture where they just think I can cancel on a whim. I want to tell yeah. them I'm not that type of person. And you know, I think it's important that medical doctors don't become that kind of person. It's the one job that you got to show up. 
And you, and I know you can be having a rough day, but we have to train people to find ways to compartmentalize. You, you have to do it. Um, you have to compartmentalize even from the 9.30 visit to the 10 o'clock visit. Find a way to put your emotions aside because it's not about you. It's not about you. You're not the patient. You know, it's about somebody else. And that's what you signed up for, I think. Well, the part that's so interesting to me is you said on Tuesday, you've got an appointment with the patient and you're the only person who can have it. And that is a great gift. That is not just um, a pleasant sidelight to your job. That is what makes your job as a doctor so extraordinarily profound, is that you are given the opportunity to do something that no one else can do well. And it comes with obligations. <laughs> Precisely because of that, it's not, oh, here's the pluses and here's the minuses, or here's the things you have to do, and, and some of them conflict at times. Because you are the only person, because you have the chance to have that very meaningful and profoundly often uh, satisfying, gratifying, poignant, painful, deep, intense interaction with another human being, you got to show up. That's the deal. And most of us don't get that job. Most of us have a job with different uh, responsibilities. We can take a day off and our job's less intense. It's less dramatic and often less meaningful. you got the meaningful job. Congratulations. But it does come with obligations. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Russ. That's really well put. And um, I think that's why I love medicine, you know, and I think that's why I chose to do what I want to do. People always ask why oncology. It's so tough. Uh, it's also so rewarding and people need you. And sometimes you feel like, particularly maybe I feel this way because my decision-making on some issues is different than a lot of my colleagues. I feel like were it not for me, things would have unfolded in a different way um, just because I have my views about evidence and drug price. But I want to say one thing. In medicine, there are a range of fields and there's a lot of fields that have become more prominent recently where you are more of an exchangeable part. They're known for having, you know, a fixed start time and a fixed stop time. And, and, you know, you can sign out your shift to the next person and students are flocking to them. I mean, I think they have a lot of allure. They pay well and you know, you're going to be out at 3.30. And I always tell people, you know, there's two types of medicine. There's uh, hours to work and things to do. And the hours to work means, you know, you look at the clock and you know, at three o'clock you're out of there. Um, and there's things to do where I have so many things to do in a day. And I don't know when I'm going to be out of there. And that sometimes means that I'm, you know, I'm not going to be home till 10.30 or 11 or later. Um, but you have to figure out the kind of person you are and which type of field you want to go into. And I could never be in the first field. Um, to me, that's not what I signed up for. That's not what I think medicine really is at its core. Um, so it has to be the second. I guess today has been Vinay Prasad. Vinay, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.